Hello, my name is Jib Amole Anderson. I am an artist, a writer, a designer, and an educator. I am also the publisher of Grio Enterprises and the creator of its flagship title, The Horseman, uh, which is the story of the gods of Africa returning to Earth and possessing seven people to save humanity from itself. I'm also the curator of the four pages, 16 bars, a visual mixtape anthology series, which is an anthology series focusing on independent works from creators of color. Uh, I am currently working on way too many things. Um, number one, um, this week, uh, we are re-releasing um, probably our most controversial title. Not probably, it is the most controversial title I've ever worked on. JBD, The Devil's Due, uh, which is a story of revolution. It is a story of nationalism, and it is a story of how to preserve or the struggle to preserve um, independence from outside forces. I also am uh, finishing up an illustrated novel, completely different, uh, called The Court, which is a mythic story of a father and a son in New York and how basketball and injury um, brings them together and helps them both to find their way when they are lost. So that's what I'm doing currently. There's probably more stuff if I think about it in a moment. Well, you know, of course, I started off um, what I like to call analog uh, because I remember a time before computers in producing this work. So, you know, I have done the, you know, pencil, pen, and ink the T-square, the triangle, the Bristol board, the whole nine. Um, as it has evolved in where I am right now, I kind of call myself more so of a collagist um, than a classical illustrator at this point because, you know, I still do rough drawings in blue pencil, but now I scan them in and uh, my weapons of choice are Photoshop um, and Illustrator, of course, to create the images, um, create the text, so on and so forth, and then InDesign to lay out the whole project. So especially over the past um, couple of years, I found myself really leaning into the design aspect, you know, being a collagist and Honestly, when I feel like I'm working on the computer and, and you know, not doing, uh, not using a stylus, um, I don't feel necessarily like an illustrator. That is kind of weird because I know so many people are now working digitally and it's smart to work digitally. And that's why I'm working digitally because it, um, it sort of condenses the workflow into one space. With that being said, I am still a fan of what, again, the analog process as opposed to the digital process. And I take that sort of analog thinking and apply it to um, the digital work. Um, because again, you know, the computer is not a creative thinking tool. It is a box and it takes a creative thinker to use the programs um, to their desired outcome, uh, if that's the best way to put it. Um, so definitely, even though I'm doing a lot of quote unquote collaging work, the way that I work is that I wanna make sure that it feels like a page. I wanna make sure that it feels like, you know, the intent is there and the feeling is there and you still get that vibe, like making sure that when I'm using a computer that the work that I produce is not cold and unfeeling, but warm and accessible and visceral and it hits people in the gut and they still want to, you know, read it. And even though everybody knows we use these tools, like it's like, yeah, you know I use Photoshop, but do you use Photoshop the way that I use Photoshop? 
therein lies the magic. Therein lies the artistry, right? It's not that the program makes me a better artist. It's that I just use the program as a different medium, the same way that I would use a pen, the same way that I would use a pencil, the same way that I would use a paintbrush, you know, the same way that I think about color. All of that is still here, right? It's not in the computer. It's still here. And I have to access what I know and what I'm studying and what I'm learning and apply it to my work in order, again, to um, create work that I enjoy and that hopefully other people enjoy, but more importantly, that other people feel. What influences me in terms of the work that I create? Well, I've accepted <laughs> um, a long ago that I'm a child of the 70s and the 80s. So when it comes to comic book art, you know, that's still a huge influence in terms of my influences, I'm that George Perez, John Byrne, Alan Davis, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez um, kind of artist. I'm that artist that likes, you know, somewhat real world proportions, a little bit of a uh, cartoony flavor, that sort of thing, that's my root. At the same time, you know, being, um, being an artist and being trained um, academically uh, as an artist allow me to open up and see other art movements so um, at the same time you know I can be I can be inspired by street art or graffiti I can be inspired by uh, Alphonse Mucha um, I, or JC Leyendecker or of course Frank Frazetta or Boris Vallejo you know or um, a Bill Sienkiewicz I like looking at artists whose styles are similar to the way that I view the world and also styles that are not similar to the way that I view the world. It just allows me, it gives me a broader um, reference base to draw from when I'm creating. Uh, I have to say like Pinterest is one of the greatest things in the world because I can just grab things that, you know, that I like and that can inspire me. And, you know, I may use it at a later date. Um, for example, uh, I just re-released and redesigned um, my book, uh, Contrast, Blackness and White, that I kind of did at the end of 2019, put it together, and I didn't see that that book was moving. And, um, I looked at why that book wasn't moving and I realized that it wasn't moving because the design was off, the package was off. Now, what inspired me to redesign that book is because at the end of 2019, the beginning, the beginning of 2020, um, I was working on a piece that I was thinking that I was going to put in an anthology. And I was working in black and white with that piece. And I was actually kind of going through uh, a moment of imposter syndrome. And with this project, I wanted to sort of kind of push the limits of the collage, if you will, and see if I could, you know, bring it back in a way to some sort of sequential storytelling but at the same time being um, open and being somewhat experimental with my layouts. And thanks to Pinterest, um, I was drawn to the work of Sergio Topi. And I looked at that stuff, I'm like, wow, okay, that was my inspiration. And so in designing this piece, I was really going in with like, you know, the lettering and the placement and all that other stuff, really being a designer. And when I was done with it, and I was working in black and white in the beginning, and eventually going to apply it to color, but when I was done with the black and white aspect of it, I'm like, wow, this looks really good. And I shared the stuff, I shared it in one page, these 12 pages, um, on Facebook. And uh, I was like, just thinking about 
you know, what do you guys think? This is, you know, something that's in the process of me working on it. And it was actually uh, my friend, uh, our friend and colleague, uh, SoulCon veteran, Stacy Robinson, who responded on FB and said, yo, don't put any color on it. It's perfect black and white. And because of that, I was like, okay. And because this anthology wasn't going to get started till <clears throat> July, and I had this work in here that I was really proud of, I said, I want to display it. I want to show it. I want to put it in there, you know? And it's also a crucial story in the horseman mythos, if you will. So that actually prompted me to put it in the contrast book. And I was looking at this pages and I was looking at the cover of contrast and how it was laid out. I'm like, yeah, that covers trash, you know? So what it did is that it actually, that story and those influences and looking at Pinterest forced me to take a look at the package design for contrast and really take a step back and think about as a designer, solve these problems, right? You know, getting back into, and excuse me for being in teacher mode right quick because I just got done with class. So um, it got me back into thinking about the principles of design, thinking about typography, thinking about layout, thinking about my color usage, my palettes, you know, my grids and the hierarchy and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, um, redesigning that package and it also increased the page count to a 48 pager. So doing all of that stuff at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, this looks really, really good. And also as a result, um, before the pandemic, uh, I was at C2E2 and I was sharing a table with Greg, uh, Elise, who's the creator of, of Isnana the Were Spider and, or, and also Dorfi Jean, who is uh, the creator of Spirit's Destiny. And I had this new copy of, um, of Contrast and sold out. Like the, like the book sold out. And it definitely sold out because of the fact that I took that time, took a step back, and again, informed all of this work, right? With all of this thought process, infused it with all of this intention so on and so forth and so and the look of the book again um is indicative of the style that i have you know developed through uh the use of technology but at the same time it still has it still has that feel you know what i mean and it has even more of that pop right now so um going back to your original question in terms of influences, I'm still very much influenced by classic, you know, classic comic book art. And um, I try to invoke that, get that spirit and feeling into my work, um, even though I'm now working in largely this digital space. Uh, how has the pandemic affected um, my career and my business? I also have to add in or add in this question, how has the political and racial uprising affected my career and my business? Well, I have to say, honestly, um, I've been busier than I have been in a moment, right? So on the comic book tip, all right? And this is how it all ties in together. <laughs> okay, with the pandemic. In the beginning of the pandemic, when people really realized how, um, can I say this, fucked we were um, because of um, the federal government that we have in place right now, um, all of the traditional venues and all the traditional companies and all the traditional modes of doing business we're panicking, right? I've been reading like local comic book stores. They're like, what are we going to do? Um, you know, the diamond distribution um, debacle. Everybody's like, oh my goodness. Oh, oh, what are we, what is we going to do? DC and Marvel is in trouble. Oh Lordy, what is we going to do? What is we going to do? Whereas I'm over here 
and so many other independent creators, you know, especially the Black Comics Cats, we're here sitting and we're like, yeah, you know what? Diamond didn't our, take our books initially. So we had to create alternative modes of distribution. We had to be on the print on demand. We had to do the Kickstarters. We had to um, have that web presence solid, right? Um, and also as a result of this uh, pandemic, um, other steps were taken. We now do have a black distributor, BIC, that uh, specializes you know, in comics of color getting to stores, so on and so forth. So the pandemic didn't hurt me um, as a creator and in my business. If anything, um, it was an opportunity, right? It was an opportunity to really get out there. So the first thing that I did after an interview, I, we had this interview right when the pandemic started, and um, I was speaking with uh, uh, Michael uh, Dando Norton. I'm hoping I got his the, the middle and the last names correct. And um, in this discussion for his class, I said, you know what? I'm going to create a bundle. I'm going to create a bunker bundle, right? And um, in a bunker bundle, it was the opportunity to sell some of the books that I was selling at C2E2. So, you know, I put contrast in there. I put... Um, another book that I did uh, called The Union in there. And then I also had the first three issues of The Horseman in there. And for that bundle, this is, I was like, you know, I had it also in print and digital, right? Because again, thanks, print on demand. And um, so I just started marketing and it's like, yo, you guys are worried about getting new comics? We got new comics for you. What, what do you need, you know? And on top of that, I know that you guys are, broke and struggling, here are these packages that you can buy of our stuff. And it started selling. Then I would say, unfortunately, when the George Floyd thing happened, you know, that was the big powder keg. And you could say one benefit of the pandemic is that people were set, set at home and they had to see that. So you have the world, the globe, saying Black Lives Matter now, okay? And then also on the same tip, you now have these traditional structures and traditional modes of storytelling and these people trying to find stories and they can't find stories. And they're like, oh, wait a minute. Black lives do matter. We need to find or we need to look at some African-American creators and see what their books are about. So you know, the sort of backhanded benefit of the pandemic and this racial upheaval is that I got a whole bunch of people now trying to holler at me. I got a whole bunch of people now. And then in addition, because of the horsemen and for pages 16 bars, right? And JBD, because they already know the work that I do. Now I'm like the person like, oh yeah, we need to talk to Jim Anderson. Can we talk to you? Um, you know, can we interview you for this? Can we focus on you for this? So on and so forth. So as a result, for instance, in June, I sold 230 and I sold over 230 books. You know, it's like sitting on my cookies, right? Because of all of these things happening, right? And being in a situation of the right place and the right time, and also being in a situation of because traditional venues or traditional systems pushed me and other creators out, we had to find alternate ways, right? So in other words, we had to be ahead of the curve. We, we had to be ahead of the pandemic before the pandemic even became the pandemic. So we were the head of the curve for years doing this stuff, right? And now when everything has gone to pot, now it's like, oh, this is happening. You know, this is happening as well. And um, I would say, again, a benefit of the pandemic is that the old modes and models have been completely disrupted. And so now, because they have been disrupted, you know, you have the opportunity for 
new and interesting voices and interesting projects to come to the fore, right? Mm -hmm. Like for instance, the movie, The Old Guard. Love The Old Guard on Netflix. If it was like a classic or a regular film season, I think that film would have get would have gotten lost. Um, the same thing as uh, Project Power with Jamie Foxx, right? That flick that just came out on Netflix. If it was a classic cinematic season where we had the theaters and things of that, of that nature, those, those projects would have gotten lost. But now, because of the fact that we can't see Wonder Woman 1984 yet, we can't see the next Fast, Fast and Furious, you know what I mean? Uh, all these classic modes have been thrown out the window there's an opportunity for these other projects, which are really good to, you know, to be seen and be appreciated. And also on top of that, it's also a great time to be independent, right? And to have our unfettered, undiluted voices out there. Because now people are seeing those voices, they're like, wow, this is really good. And of course, you know, the power structure is like, wow, we need to get up on that thing about it is is that you already now know that this model a is proven b if you go to us as creators we can make more demands and we can have our projects be more pure as they are intended right and that is again because of um what's happening right now like we are in in a we are in an apocalyptic moment right? We are in an apocalypse right now, okay? The thing that people never seem to understand or the part of the apocalypse that they forget about is the new world that comes forth. And we are in a situation politically, economically, creatively, we are in a position to affect real and lasting change. And so in terms of, you know, how's the pandemic affected me and my career, I look at it as an opportunity and I've been taking every opportunity as it comes. Where do we go from here? Um, that is a very good question on a couple of levels on so many levels, like, you know, um, as was stated, I mean, there is so much upheaval right now. There is so much, um, quote unquote, boredom right now, because, you know, as people are being locked down, they're actually being forced to reckon with themselves. Like, they, like they've been very, they've been forced to look in the mirror. And if you haven't done that as a practice, if you haven't quote unquote checked yourself every so often, right? Um, having this extended period where you need to check yourself <laughs> is a lot. And you also see like people don't know how to handle it. You see how people don't know how to speak. People don't know their emotions, right? It's an, it's an interesting situation that you see how many people have been so used and so inundated to the rat race that once that is taken away from them, in a lot of ways, their identity has been taken away from them. Um, we were talking about this earlier about like some of the people commenting on my work and not having read my work and they think that they are these pinnacles of cultural thought and whatnot. But if you were a pinnacle of cultural thought, then you would not be afraid to look at the work of someone else that has always already been working in this space, right? And so this is an opportunity to question. This is an opportunity to um, imagine. This is also an opportunity to find your own identity, right? And what I've seen from all of this discourse, I see a lot of it is that people simply do not know who they are. They do not know who they are on that gut core level. Like their identity has been defined or they have defined their identity by others. And so 
with all of that being said, like for me, you know, part of me being an artist is also part, it's always self-reflection, right? Because as artists, our job is to give a little bit of our soul to the audience. And we hope they like it, right? Because if they like it, they give us money and then we can eat, you know? Um, that is, I mean, that's where the artist ego comes from, right? The, the artist ego comes from, um, it, it comes from the dichotomy of the extreme insecurity because you're burying your soul, right? And also um, the extreme arrogance of like, your soul is the most valid soul on the planet <laughs> and you must hear me, okay? So um, imagine that kind of vibe, right? As artists, you already have that. You have an outlet for that, right? Imagine being someone who doesn't have that outlet and how they respond to that, you know, how they are responding to that. Um, with all of that being said, in terms of where do I, where am I going from here? Um, this pandemic has given me the opportunity to really sit down and think about what's what and what matters. Because what we've seen with this pandemic is that Ultimately, money don't mean a goddamn thing. No matter how much money you have right now, everybody's shut down. Everybody's, everybody's supposed to social distance, right? Everybody can't go out to restaurants. You know, rich folks, especially in America, you can't fly to Europe. Thanks, Trump. <laughs> you, you, you know, you can't, you can't go to these places. So you got to figure out who you are. And so I've been sitting down here and I've been working at it and I've been thinking like, honestly, the only thing that has changed about my life pre pandemic and post pandemic is that I don't have the opportunity to see my friends like I want to right now. But in terms of everything else, in terms of what I do, what I have done, what I am about to do, it's like, I'm living my ideal life. I'm living the life that I said at the age of 10, I wanted to live, right? As a matter of fact, I'm doing more than my 10 year old self could think of, you know? I'm a, I'm a comic book creator. I'm um, an intellectual property owner. Um, I'm working, you know what I mean? Not only am I working on my books and my work, I'm working on other people's books, you know, I'm I'm um, working with a friend of mine, a dear um, and beloved friend of mine. I'm helping her in an editorial capacity and in a design and lettering capacity, helping her get her graphic novel off. Right? Um, I had the opportunity because of <clears throat> where I am in this comic book industry um, that I'm working on a project at the end of the year with my god brother, you know, who's, um, who's a landscape architect. But um, the thing is, you know, we grew up making comics and there was an opportunity for another anthology to be a part of. And I submitted something that he sent to me because he thought this would be a cool idea. I sent it to the anthology and because of, you know, the anthology is called Modern Mythology. So it's like <laughs> a no brainer, right? For me to be a part of but the fun part about that is that you know i brought my god brother back into this and so we're gonna have fun as adult men making comics like we were when we were kids and that's the dope part that's that's what that's what matters you know um in a couple of days i hope to have extremely great news of the next level of that in my in terms of my career um, but as it stands right now, you know, I'm doing the work, I'm doing the thing, I'm being me, I am living fully and wholly in my identity. I know who I am and I, um, not only have I come to terms with who I am, um, I enjoy who I am. I'm learning to really enjoy that. 
Now, in terms of the career and in terms of the industry and where we're going, again, we're in a period of great change. You know what I mean? The wheel is turning, right? Um, again, you always have these chicken littles asking like, oh, the sky is falling, comics are over. Oh, DC, Marvel, oh my God, what's happening with comics? Comics are gonna die. Comics ain't never gonna die. Comics are not a company. Comics aren't DC or Marvel or Image or Dark Horse or Boom or even Griot Enterprises. Comics are an art form. And that art form isn't going anywhere. It's just changing and evolving. And again, as an independent creator, not having the resources or the wherewithal to kick out monthly 32-page periodicals, like the corporate two, as I like to call them, you know, we're finding different models, right? We're doing graphic novels, and we're getting them out there. We're doing the Kickstarters. We're doing the print-on-demand, so on and so forth. We are going to be fine, right? And for somebody coming into the game at this time, at this period of upheaval, now you know you don't have to <laughs> work for DC or Marvel to be in comics. Matter of fact, you can't work at DC or Marvel right now if you want to get into comics. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just straight up. If you ain't already in there, you're out of there. And even the people that were in there, like Warner, Warner, Warner Media let a lot of people go over the past week, right? So the traditional model has changed, right? So if you want to get into the mix now, you got to do it for self. And what that means is now you have to know or you have to study the game properly in order to be successful. Cats like me and Crystal and so many other of us who are already marginalized We've already created the new models and the modes and the systems, right? People coming in, what they need to do is they need to plug into our models now. And that's the way that they are going to survive, resist, and excel in their career and in this art form and in this business that we call comedy.